I spent a year in Poland in the 1960s. And later on, I published a few articles about Jewish history. And although I'm not a professional historian anymore, I still retain uh, my interest in that in that field, and in, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, Steve mentioned to me before you all got on, I went with uh, a grad's trip to Poland about 15 years ago, which was sort of like a homecoming for me because I had lived there in 1966 and 67. Uh, uh, it's a, still an interesting place and you know you talk to jews they have mixed emotions about poland and ukraine because of issues in the past so what i would like to do is present this material and what i want to say is that if you have a question uh, no problem at any time if you have a comment i'd prefer that you wait till the end since you know, it's a Jewish group, it's a Jewish subject, everybody is going to have comments. So hold on to those. But questions, just uh, let's see what you have to say. So I'm going to start since uh, we have a time issue. And I've called it the Jews of Poland and Ukraine. And it, it's sort of a, a survey. So I don't know how much you are acquainted with this and how much not. So some of this stuff you may know already. But let's look. There's a there's a map of Central Europe in the 19th century. And when you talk about the Jews there, don't know what to do with them and how to categorize them. Are they a nationality? Not really. Uh, are they a religious group? Yeah, but they're more than that. And when we look at that map, you see in orange, it says Kingdom of Poland. That's the first half of the 19th century under uh, Russian tutelage. And the white part is the infamous Pale of Settlement, which I assume you've all heard the term. You may not have been sure what it meant, but it's that area of Russia uh, to which Jews had this were confined. And uh, you see my arrow here, all that stuff here, that's Ukraine. So things are going on down there that you may see names in the paper even now that refer to places. Certainly uh, Kiev right here, Odessa down here on the Black Sea, and the uh, current fighting is going on along here. But uh, Kharkov or Kharkiv in the in Ukrainian, was a major Jewish center. Now, what the Jews had was a kind of self-government, if you will, that ended in the mid-18th century. By self-government, what I mean is they collected their own taxes and then had to forward them, and they settled their internal disputes internally without going to the government in the main. Uh, and that that kind of autonomy ended in the uh, middle of the 18th century, and especially after the partitions of Poland. Remember, Poland was a independent country, and it was. I'm going to swing around about how big it was. This huge area in here. One time was the largest country in Europe. It was all this stuff here, uh, and after 1795, that was the end of independent Poland. Uh, which had its effects on the Jews, and we'll see that. And then we have, as I say, this pale of settlement, and one area of Poland that did not go to Russia is right here. It's Galicia. So I'm, I suspect you've all heard the term Galiciano from Galicia. Large numbers of Jews, heavily Hasidic, came from here. Uh, and the other people living there were Germans, and what is left out, a lot of books until recently, were Ukrainians. This is a strong Ukrainian area, and in fact, today, the most intensely nationalistic part of Galicia is here, of uh, Ukraine, is right here. So, let's go back. Polish aristocracy kind of was in conflict with the Polish cities. 
And it's really uh, extraordinarily complicated. The cities had this, let me use this Latin term, the non tolerandi judeis mean Jews are not allowed. And they had that legal right. But the Polish aristocracy also controlled some towns and they wanted Jews for economic reasons. They were easier to control and they uh, had uh, business connections. And then we have Vilna, Vilno, Vilnius, depending what language you're talking about. And I assume you've all heard of Vilna, even if you don't, not exactly sure where it is. Uh, and until the 17th century, you have the quote, four nations, Lithuanians, Poles, Ruthenes, who are Ukrainians, and Germans. Mm -hmm. So that's really an issue. So here we have in the 18th century, the, the Polish same, supposedly all the aristocrats are able to choose a, uh, a king. So we get these nobles lined up. It's a country full of nobles with their private armies, right? You can see them back here. And then, whoops. In Lvov, again, I'm throwing out places that you probably have heard of. Lviv now, Lvov under the Poles. There's kind of local autonomy with Jews who were in conflict with the Armenians. We don't read about that much, but that's what was going on down there. In general, you could say in the West, like Galicia or Poland, there were Germans in the cities and the rural population was Polish, mixed with Jews. In the East and South, there were Poles in the cities and Ruthenian, meaning Ukrainian or Lithuanian in the rural areas. And in all of those, you have Jewish communities. Well, you're familiar with the term shtetl, and that's where they were. And as I say, there's this conflict. Who? It's not, a, it's not a country in the sense that we know. There's no central administration that can do stuff. Uh, liberum veto means the, uh, the aristocrats have a lot of power. And the nobles were very interested in, in controlling the Christians and they used the Jews to do that. Uh, and then I have one more picture here. Right at the time of the third part, second and third partition, the Poles tried to fight back. And in fact, there was a lot of Jewish support for Polish independence. Later on, uh, when Napoleon invaded, you have a number of Jews who rallied to the flag. One of the ways they lived was leaseholding. That is to say, they paid cash to the nobles and they collected taxes and they kept what was extra. So it really, first of all, divided the Jews from the local population. And in addition to the traditional Christian anti-Semitism, it fed the notion of the Jews as oppressors. Mm -hmm. Was that a question or just a comment or just a noise? Comment. <laughs> okay. So, as I say, in the, in the Polish Commonwealth, they say over a third of the Jews were leaseholders of various kinds, small leases, large leases. Uh, but in the peasant eyes, Jews become identified as the oppressor, as the one who, to whom they pay taxes. And the Cossacks who emerge in the 17th century are really resent them. Uh, even though the Jews themselves, most of them are poverty stricken, it didn't save them from the enmity of the surrounding population. And then in the, starting in the 17th century, they lost their place in large estates, started going to smaller estates. And these are some of the areas where they you know, milling, fishing, forest, sell, tobacco. It's just ways of making a living. But most important, here's a term, propinatia. In many areas, they had a monopoly on the sale of alcohol. So in addition to being tax collectors, they are the innkeepers. 
And here's a picture of a stereotype Jewish tavern. You see behind the bar, the Jewish owner is pouring drinks. To his side, a Jewish musician, which was another Jewish occupation. And you see this uh, aristocrat, a noble, who probably was dirt poor himself. He otherwise he wouldn't be going to such a dump. But this is the, the image of what Eastern European looked like. Larry, I do have a question. Uh, was that painted by a non-Jew? Because it's rather stereotyped about the religious Jew pouring alcohol. Well, uh, I don't know who painted it, but in fact, the Jews had a monopoly on the taverns. So that was pretty accurate. Right, right. We know yeah. we know that, but uh, the the pic the depiction. Oh, wearing it. Um, you mean with Pais and a talus? Yeah, yeah. It sits yeah. rather. Yeah. Um, what can we say? The the Hasidim today still dress similarly. Of course, so right. they that's got where they got it from. That's not, where they got it from. But they're right. not operating taverns. I mean, you know, it, that doesn't quite go with uh, pouring liquor. Jews. Well, the mana. Well, but the the clothing comes from that period. I mean, I by the 19th century, they begin to get squeezed out of that. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, though, in interwar Poland, there's still a few remnants of this uh, Jewish community. They, there was a Jewish tax on kosher meat that helped support the community. So it lasts into the 20th century. I mean, in that case, it's not it's not alcohol, but it's still internal. What did they believe? This is about religion. You know, Gershom Shalom, whom I assume you've heard of, Judaism cannot be defined according to its essence, since it has no essence. And by that, we, we mean theology. I think that's what he means, theology, as opposed to our daily practice. Judaism is really, in a way, defined by its practice. Uh, it's a religion of law. You know, this is not new to you, but the rabbi's main task was not to give a sermon, but to elucidate the law, often about uh, what's what's kosher, what's not kosher, or whether people can get divorced and so on. And the Polish rabbinate was known as uh, pretty strict. They became the leading European rabbis. And they began to prize asceticism, that is, the rejected leniency. It was, uh, they were very tough whenever these legal issues came up. And we'll see in a second how, what that has to do with the rise of Hasidism. But this is just, uh, I assume most, uh, many of you are familiar with this. You know, it's the, uh, First page of the Babylonian Talmud, and if you think, if you look at it, remember, here's this is the the Talmud right here in the center, and all this other stuff are commentaries or commentaries on commentaries. So uh, that's what these Polish rabbis are doing in writing even more commentaries. And you had by the 19th, you have two kinds of rabbis, the town rabbi who in the 19th century gets a salary from the synagogue, and then he makes a little bit from weddings and funerals and so on. And some of the leading scholars found their own yeshivas. In addition, you have the Zohar, a mystical tradition, oops, why did that do that? A mystical tradition that uh, we'll see how it comes into play. In the uh, 17th century, particularly in 1648, there are huge pogroms, massacres of Jews by Cossacks led by a man named Khmelnytsky. Uh, even though the numbers may have been exaggerated, many people were killed. It's one one uh, estimate, six to eight percent of the community. Uh, and so there is, we'll see, there's this messianic fervor after the 1648 massacres. Now, uh, I just throw a picture in here to say that on the one hand, you have the massacres, and the other hand, people are still 
trying to create a life. And if you get to Warsaw today, uh, the uh, Museum of Polish Jewish History, which opened a few years ago, and this is one of their prize exhibits. It's a recreated synagogue. They weren't quite that fancy, but it's quite a, a thing to see. And I didn't want to pass over this without your having a picture of it anyway. But after these massacres, the population began to grow for whatever reason. You got three quarters of a million Jews in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the middle of the uh, 17th, 18th century. Uh, but you also have what are called faith healers to try to minister the population. And the most famous one is the Baal Shem Tov, or Besht. And uh, his notion was that prayer enables union with God, but it has to be prayer with intent. Kavana is the term used, and with joy. And this is from his followers. He died in uh, 1760. From his followers, we get the emergence of the Hasidic movement. And here is his tomb. It's still, still down there in, in Ukraine, by the way. Has, you know, Hasidism comes out of Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, it's not just a theological challenge. It doesn't, doesn't just say we're going to pray differently. It's a challenge to the elite, the traditional rabbin and the community leaders, because when you change the prayer in this way and you begin to get uh, focus on local leaders at Sadiqim, who are sort of themselves supposedly faith healers, that's a challenge to the way the community is set up. You know, it, it, it's not... It's not like you had, uh, you know, sort of Quakers who go off on their own. They are taking over the community. And in one sense, you can see a parallel to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, where the community splits apart. And we'll see. I'm sorry, what? Oh, if someone, if someone should mute himself. It's not late. Yeah. So there's a battle for control of the Kihela, the local community. Uh, and here in 1750s, for example, the rabbis appealed to the Roman Catholic Church to help them defeat the heresy of a group called the Frankists. That is, there are these so-called heresies emerging. The Frankists are a well-known one that uh, that come in the 18th century. In the 17th century, you may have heard of Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, you know, don't have time to go into that development. But these things happened. At the same time, the disciples of the Besht, the, uh, the, the who is the head of what becomes Hasidism, spread throughout Ukraine. Uh, and eventually, here's an image of where you, uh, Hasidism is centered. Uh, I really, I, 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 I'm going to have to stop this and go back to the beginning if I have to uh, mute everybody. I wish you would mute yourselves. Yeah. So we were looking at this spread of Hasidism. And if you reading the newspapers now about the war in between Russia and Ukraine, here's where it's taking place. Uh, all these towns here, uh, and they have, you know, you begin to get Hasidic dynasties. And some of the uh, most famous ones are down here in Vishnitsa, they're still around. The belts are Hasidim and uh, these are what are called the Gera. The Gera Rebbe was in a, a Polish town of Gura Kalvaria. But those are the, 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 some of the largest centers. But there are many, many uh, Polish centers, all the furthest, more in the south and north. And we'll see in a second up here, the so-called Misnagdim, the, uh, the uh, opponents of Hasidism.
They appeal to the entire community. This is one of the things that, that sets them apart. Joy and intent in prayer is more important than learning. The emergence of the tzaddik, an individual who's sort of a local leader, is, and he is... I guess people consider that he has a direct line to God. You know, he begin, they begin to, to go to him and ask him for his intercession. Uh, and there are some good sadikim and some corrupt ones. And you probably have read about them uh, in today, either you know, centered in New York and Jerusalem and New York State. Uh, but the, the tzaddik is really the key person. They meet in a shtibu, sort of a little prayer house. And I say, where does Hasidism go? It's down here. It's interesting, up here, Lubavitch, the Lubavitch Rebbe emerges as a figure who does not deny what the Hasidim want or do, but he also says that traditional learning is important. And in my mind, the emergence of the Lubavitcher is what prevented a, a schism like Catholics and Protestants. I mean, eventually by the 19th century, it's sort of not exactly live and let live, but uh, they certainly did not split apart into in more than one religion. And you have a continuation of the Rebbe, the Sonic of Joy and Religion. Now, this is a Sotma Rebbe. The Sotma are the largest group now. And I, I'm going to play just a little bit of this to see the community. I don't know if you got that sound or not. Was Harry, it coming through? Harry, we're not getting the sound. Not getting the sound. Well, uh, let's see what we can do about that. We're going to do this. And we're going to share the sound. I'm going to try again. Are you getting it now? Yes. Yes, we're getting and Okay. I mean, we don't I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You can search it yourself on the uh, uh internet. The point is that this is a community, it, it, they're all men there, by the way, there are no women in this audience. Uh, lots of little kids, uh, lots of men, and they're all around, He's, the man in the white is the Rebbe. So we will, uh, I don't have time to watch all that, but you might you know, just search for on on YouTube. You get, again, some of you are probably familiar with this, a struggle between Hasidim and Misnagdim. Now, Misnagdim or Misnagdim, traditional rabbinic Judaism, they're in a weak position. I mean, if you call yourself the opponents, that's what it means. You have a trouble with self, we have trouble with self identification if you're the opponents, but they are further north. Uh, up in what what was called Lithuania, but we would call Lithuania and White Russia and parts of Poland. And the most well-known figure, again, is the Vilna Gaon. Uh, you see him here, this uh, image of the Vilna Gaon, a very ascetic individual who devoted a lot of his time to opposing the Hasidim. There were mutual recriminations at the time. For example, some of the uh, Misnagdim turned in the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe as a uh, is doing things wrong in Russia, and he was in jail for a while uh, on the because of Jewish denunciation. So it was not a happy relationship for a while. 
But as I say, Chabad is the great compromise. And you probably you heard, well, Steve mentioned before, it was around the corner from the local Lubavitcher uh, representative, uh, who this is the one group that is looking for converts. And they are combining the Kabbalah, the traditional uh, mystic tradition with Torah. And the word Chabad itself comes from Chochmah, Bina, and Dea, which is not showing here, but uh, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. All this is just a, uh, a graphic to try to talk about these various spheres. As opposed to at the same time in the 19th century, you got the Enlightenment, where we talk about integration into the larger society. And you have a question of, do you acculturate or do you assimilate? I mean, you American Jews have those same questions today. Started in Germany, where Moses Mendelssohn translates the, uh, the Pentateuch, that is the five books of Moses. And in Galicia, the Haskalah focuses on attacking the Hasidim, just like the Hasidim are attacking the uh, Misnagdim elsewhere here in, in Galicia. That's what they focus on. In Russia, the Haskalah got the government behind them. So they got some uh, jobs as rabbis or as teachers, but they didn't do didn't weren't very successful reaching the large population. Although you do get the rise of a Jewish intelligentsia, that there were, and you'll see those at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. They're very important for Jewish society, for Zionism, for uh, or for uh, things that occur in Western Europe. And by the middle of the 19th century, they realize the Hasidim and the uh, Mislagdim realize that their enemy is the Haskalah. So this also brings the groups together. Vilna is the what's called the Jerusalem of Lithuania. I'm not sure if you, some of you may know this song. It goes, Vilna stadt von Geist und Mimes, Vilna Yiddish lach verpacht, Wo es Mormon still it will is, still is soides von der Nacht. And then goes down here. Vilne, Vilne, unser Heimstadt, unser Bankschaft und Bager. Ach, wie oft es ruft dein Nomen von mein Euga Reusatreur. Vilne Geslach, Vilne Teichen, Vilne Berg und Tor. Epis Neue, Epis bringt sich noch die Zeiten von Amol. And now you, you see in the English, it's sort of uh, nostalgia for how wonderful Vilna was. And I can tell you, Vilna was a city where people were desperately poor. But in the, in the image, uh, it's, it's a wonderful place. Our hometown. Uh, something gnaws at me, something makes me long for the times of the past. In the 19th century, we also get the shtetl, which you probably are familiar with from Fiddle on the Roof. Uh, it wasn't such a great place in terms of economic. There was a, a community in some places, the community was very tight. In other places, it was not. Uh, but in 1861, when serfdom is abolished, this is combines with population pressure, and you begin to get emigration from Eastern Europe to Western Europe and to the United States. And my feeling is that it's not just the pogroms that started in the 1880s that caused that emigration. It's it starts when there is population pressure and the invention of the steamship. You have people going all through Central Europe, recruiting people, selling tickets for those steamships. But then when the pogroms in Southern Russia start in the 1880s, people want to get out. Uh, here is uh, a novel, a novella called The Headband. I mean, what is the shtetl? A few cabins and a fair every other Sunday. 
The Jews deal in liquor, grain, burlap, or tar. Usually there's a man striving to be a Hasidic Rebbe. So that's not a not the same romantic image that you find in Fiddler on the Roof. You know, it's a it's a it's some wooden homes, one rich man, a few prosperous shopkeepers. Uh, you have a, a, a Kehila Kadaisha that is for burying people, a synagogue, study house, Hasidic stibbles. It was a world unto itself, but was economically incredibly poor. So when you look at this picture, uh, what he's carrying on his back is a the stuff that he sells. And you know, most of the, a lot of these men are on the road all week and they come home on the weekend or for Shabbat, and that's it. A tough life. Uh, and some of their other occupations, shoemaker, tailor, baker, butcher. But really, it's the peddler who becomes the core of the the largest number of uh, of uh, employed people. Uh, you also have a cheder. I th some of you may have seen this picture. It's a famous picture of children in a cheder. You know, it's starting pretty young. Uh, so there's a certain amount of literacy, but usually in uh, Yiddish, spoken Yiddish, and, and they can read Hebrew a little bit. In Galicia and Ukraine, the Hasidim have annual pilgrimages to the Rebbe. Uh, and I mentioned important Hasidic dynasties, Ger in Poland, Ruzhin in Galicia. Nachman of Breslov, the dead Hasidim, they call him that because after Nachman died, he did not have a, a successor. But even in the middle of the war between Ukraine and Russia, you have uh, Braslav or Hasidim trying to sneak across the border for their annual trip to the burial place of Reb Nachman. And that, that, that's in 2022. And that tradition is continuing. We mentioned everyone's heard pogroms. You've heard the word. What is a pogrom? Essentially, it's attack on the local population. Uh, on a civilian population without regard for their status in uh, any kind of military field. And you, you try attack a whole area of, of the town. How the Jews react? Most of the time, uh, they just tried to hide. A lot of them tried to emigrate, as you see in some of these pictures from Ellis Island. And Lots of, you know, uh, the Jews in America, mainly from Eastern Europe. And you see from 1880 to 1930, we have 1,750,000 Jews in the United States. That's a huge number of people. And look at those pick numbers for the decades. The average per year, you know, going into the 1880s, you know, almost 13,000 each year after 1900. 82,000 per year. It's an incredible number of people moving. And they go not just to America. They're going to the cities. In, the, in Eastern Europe, it's Odessa, Warsaw, Wuch. Uh, so, you know, these are the communities that we hear about because then you begin to get more literature from them. And Again, one of the movements, assimilation or acculturation. That's what we see in America. Talk about that. Autonomism, that is a movement for having your self-government, or Zionism for moving out. And then in 1903, there's an infamous pogrom in the city of Kishinev, southern, sort of Romania on the border of Ukraine. It was one-third Jewish, one-third Romanian. And it was a horrible pogrom, in some ways not different from others, but Chaim Nachman Bialik, who is considered by many the Jewish national poet, wrote a poem called In the City of Slaughter, where he says, Come now, and I will bring thee to their lairs, the privies, jakes, and pigpens, where the heirs of Hasmoneans lay with trembling knees, 
concealed and cowering, the sons of the Maccabees, the seeds of saints, the scions of the lions, that is, is attacking the Jews for the passivity in the face of these attacks. And although there were self-defense forces before that, this really gave a fillip to the development of such groups. Uh, this is another set of poems from Bialik called from, from Sal and Sal, uh, about sorrow and rage. And he's making, I, I suspect he's making a, a, a pun here, but Sal meaning sorrow and Tsar being the Russian emperor. And you get these self-defense groups and you, it doesn't prevent the pogroms, but it does do give some defense. And what happens is that lots of Jews become left-wingers, and uh, then it becomes uh, the notion that Jews are revolutionaries. Uh, again, there's a question, was the Russian government involved in the pogroms? We can't prove it. They certainly encouraged them. Now, I'm going over a lot of material very fast, but... You know, I just want to show cultural flowering in the time of economic sorrow. Uh, and we're familiar with Marc Chagall. I have other artists, but I, I just don't want to spend the time on that now. The end of the 20th, I've been the 19th century, you get the First World War. And remember, the Jews are living down in here and up in here, the large numbers of them. And the large battles of the first two years of the war are not in the West that you see in the movies. They occur in Ukraine. They occur in Galicia. So in 1914, here you have half a million people are uh, killed or wounded. Uh, and, I, and here's, this is just an example of Jews being involved. This is a book that I translated a few years ago uh, about a family living on the border between Ukraine and Galicia. Uh, the young Rottenbergs came to the conclusion that they were absolutely not ready for independent life in cities. The family set up a new set of buildings to supply the needs of developing households. They then began to set up parcels for building homes for these families. And then came August 1914. The army essentially requisitioned the entire inventory for work purposes preparing for a war front along the line of the Buk River. And that's where they live, right on the Buk River. Evacuation of the village began quickly after receipt of the order for immediate evacuation. The Rottenbergs moved deep into Russia. And when they returned from evacuation in 1918, they were completely ruined. That's sort of a, just one family. And I think it's an example of what was happening. So it got even worse in the 20th century after the First World War. Vilna becomes, as I said, you know, it's a sacred city, quote, to the Jews. They call it the Jerusalem of Lithuania, but the Poles want it, the Lithuanians want it. Uh, and what happens, it becomes a tool in the hands of the nationalists. So there's something, uh, Roman Domovsky and national democracy, a, a very vicious anti-Semite. Uh, they want and they want Vilna, well, Vilna is the Polish name. And there it is, you can see Vilna province up here. Here's interwar Poland here. Uh, this right here is part of Ukraine now, and it goes over here. And here's where Vilna is, way up in the Northeast. So uh, the Poles occupy, we're running out of time, I'm gonna go faster here. And this is just a, a Vilna street with shop signs in, in many languages. There's a war between the Poles and the Bolsheviks. Uh, there are severe pogroms, which the Poles deny took place. You know, uh, let me tell you, they did take place. Here's an example. That's one infamous picture of a man who died, uh, killed by Polish soldiers in 1919. So national revivals, Yiddish folk culture, Yivo Jewish Scientific Institute, and the Bund, which is a labor union. And uh, 
Here is a YIVO conference with famous Jewish authors. I don't have time to tell you more about them, uh, but they talk about Hebrew literacy, Zionism, or assimilation into Polish life. Uh, here's an ex a, a Yiddish language school, 1929. So Jewish culture is also booming at the same time as a tremendous pressure on the Jewish population. Uh, there's a divergence of Yiddish and Hebrew. There's a Chernovitz conference in 1908, which was an argument about Yiddish and Hebrew. And finally, the delegates decided, well, they are, Yiddish is a Jewish language. But then you get, here's uh, someone named Yankov Glachstein. He's considered one of the major Yiddish poets. He came to America. He sends a letter, a, a poem to this journal poetry. And they say, unfortunately, we cannot read your journal. We would like to know, however, what language it is printed in. Is it Chinese? So, so much for the general knowledge about what Yiddish was. There's Gladstein. Uh, and he says, how can I serve up exoticism for a Jewish audience that already knows the shuttle too extremely well, too tiresomely well? He wrote a couple of novels, and then he goes to visit Poland in the 30s. I feel aboard the ship as Jonah must have felt in that first moment when he thought he had escaped God's wrath. On Poland, see, I've never been false to you. And here's this, you know, this from the, from the Psalms, this thing about my tongue cleaving to the roof of my mouth. I'm really going to have to move along fast here. Uh, Agnon. Larry, you don't have to rush. Uh, for those of us who want to stay up to and past three o'clock, we will. Okay. Okay. Thank well, you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Shmuel Yosef Agnon wrote a novel called A Guest for the Night. It's one of his most well-known novels. You know, he won a Nobel Prize later. And he said, he goes to this little town that he was born in, which he calls uh, Shibuch, and the name is Buchach. It takes an ordinary man a quarter of an hour to walk to the center of town carrying baggage. Carrying baggage, it takes a quarter of an hour more. I took an hour and a half, every house, every ruin, Every heap of rubbish caught my eye and held me. I mean, if you were interested in a way that some people look back at Poland, I recommend this book. It's not an easy book to read, uh, but can be done. It's, you know, it's been translated to English. He wrote it in Hebrew. And the notion of a guest for the night suggests the ambiguity of Jewish settlements in Europe. Uh, and it could also might stand for the Polish attitude toward the Jews. They don't belong here. They're only guests for the night. Well, this is my comment, you know, where Thomas Wolfe wrote this uh, famous novel, You Can't Go Home Again. And when you read Agnon and when you read Glatstein, you see how true it is. Uh, meanwhile, on a broader sense, Volhynia or Volhynia here, it's Ukraine. This is Ukraine. This is Ukraine. This is Ukraine. The urban population is heavily Jewish, despite the fact that the uh, countryside is not. And the Poles try to make it Polish in the interwar period. Uh, the Communist Party becomes popular among Jewish youth because uh, they're being oppressed by the Poles. Here's a, a famous image of what a man looks like, what clothing is like in Volhynia. Uh, it's a town that's now in Ukraine. In the interwar period, there's a new Polish state. Remember, Poland is reconstructed in 1919, and it becomes the official policy becomes more and more anti-Semitic and anti-Ukrainian. So it's not as though the Jews are the only ones who are singled out. Uh, these are a couple of 
books that refer to there's a flowering of Jewish culture amidst the atmosphere of, of state anti-Semitism. For example, YIVO, which is founded in the 1920s. As you, know, you probably know, it's in New York now. Uh, in Ukraine, the Soviets have a policy called indigenation, which means you focus on the native customs, and that comes to an end at the late 20s. And this really becomes very difficult when they start collectivizing agriculture. Uh, and you see, this is a sign of the, it's in Ukrainian, it says the social base of the USSR is an unbreakable union of the workers, peasants, and intelligentsia. And it's in Ukrainian, and that was from that time, the 20s. Jews in the Soviet Union. Well, for a short time, 1917, 1918, it looked like the Jews were going to do very well in Ukraine. In fact, here is this sh uh, short lived independent government that puts out a banknote. Uh, and it's uh, here in Russian, here in Latin script, and here in Yiddish. Now, these Jews were, for a short time, accepted as full partners in that government. But very soon, they're caught up in a civil war, the white armies against the Reds and the Ukrainian armies. Uh, it, was, it became pretty tough. We not only did you have pogroms in the north in Poland, you have them in the south in Ukraine. Uh, in the, uh, on the Soviet side, the Yevsekcia is the... Jewish section of the of the Communist Party, and they allow a lot of Yiddish publishing, but not anything that would suggest autonomism or Zionism. They also, Stalin has this idea of Berobijan, which is, I think I have a map, yeah, Berobijan. Let me tell you, this is really far east. I mean, right here is Korea. So they're saying we can set up a Jewish settlement out here, way out here. It could take you several days to get there. Uh, it was, I mean, it still exists, but just tiny little things that went on in Barobajan. It did not succeed. It did not have support from the government, and it did not have enough people who were willing to go there. I heard a talk by someone who now works for uh, YIVO. Uh, for Workman Circle, and he said, when he was younger, he, someone he ran into someone in the street who said that it was Rosh Hashanah, and this guy said, "What's that?" So you know, Jewish education was not really uh, emphasized; didn't exist almost. But you know, they 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 pushed it. Hurrah for the country where national. Repression is no longer possible. Uh, and then they call it the uh, Birobijan souvenir, you know, with the red, with hammer and sickle. And then recently, there's a, uh, a lady named Masha Gessen, who now lives in New York, I think, uh, who has published a lot of stuff about Jews in Eastern Europe. And uh, she's got the book, Where the Jews Are Not, and this sad and absurd story of Viva Robijan. In 1932, I have to, this is not particularly on the Jews, but it's everybody in Ukraine. What's called the Holodomor, and it's what the Ukrainians have never forgotten. It was, there was a famine was aggravated by what the Russians did. Now, the Ukrainians say it's genocide, uh, saying it was directed uh, completely against Ukrainians. Uh, that's not clear, but it certainly was, it affected lots of Ukrainians, and millions of people died. Uh, if you're interested, there's a recent movie, Mr. Jones, which is very graphic about uh, a, a journalist's travel. Uh, and what happened is that there was forced grain collection to feed the rest of the country, and Ukrainians were left to starve way down there in, in southern Ukraine. It was a horrible experience. 
You then have killings. Stalin's crimes were associated with Russia. Hitler's crimes are associated with Germany. And this whole area of Eastern Europe is, uh, has been designated in a recent book as Bloodlands. Uh, and you should know that most people who died during the Second World War were not in concentration camps. I mean, of course, there were people, millions of people, but people died of starvation or of armies rampaging through or of uh, the uh, German killing groups associated with the army that went way into Ukraine well before concentration camps were well established. Uh, and then, of course, there are death camps, Auschwitz, Birkenau. I only mentioned Neuengamme because there are many camps that we've never heard of. And when I was in uh, in uh, Frankfurt a few years ago, we had a little trip to Neuengamme. I never heard of Neuengamme. Here it is, concentration camp right outside of Hamburg. They're all over the place. Uh, this is the Holocaust in occupied Poland, where you have the, the six big death camps, uh, you know, and it's uh, Treblinka, which took the majority of the Warsaw Jews. Uh, so Bibor was uh, Jews from Lvov, uh, from Lublin, uh, Lublin. I mean, uh, it was uh, difficult to talk about it. We all have heard about it, and I don't want to dwell on it, but it did happen, and it's still burned into our consciousness. Uh, there is some Jewish resistance that is played up in Israel, not in Israel, but in, in among certain Jewish groups, where they uh, tried to say that people were not entirely passive, and we're familiar with the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in 1943. And this is the Warsaw Fighting Organization, which is Polish. They say all are equal brothers, brown, white, black, and yellow, to separate people's colors, races is but to separate people's colors and races is but an act of cheating. So there is this progressive side of the uh, <clears throat> among the Jews too. But on the other hand, there's this a horrible document which you may have seen of it says the Jewish section of Warsaw no longer exists. And that's a document that was submitted by a Nazi commandant and it's presented in, in evidence at the Nuremberg trials. In the mid 20th century, here's, a, here's what the map looks like after the Second World War. And you, there's still significant Jewish communities here. I mean, those in Poland were mainly wiped out. Uh, in Romania, lots of uh, Romania and Bulgaria, there's not a lot of, uh, of survivors. So some 14 million people are killed in the 30s and 40s. And I mentioned the bloodlands, which means this, Central Poland, Western Europe, Western Ukraine, Western Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states, which are right here. These, this, these are the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Oh, okay. There they are. I made that to point out where these areas are. Who was involved in the Holocaust beside the Germans? There were certainly Ukrainian groups. These are just the names of their various armies. Uh, and here is in 20, 2013, they're still celebrating their, quote, heroes from the Galician SS. So there were these people. And we have this infamous case of Yedvadne, uh, where Polish people drove Jews into a barn and burned it down. And then Jan Gross published this book on it and it was created quite a stir in Poland. You know, he's accused of being uh, kind of uh, just someone uh, interested in attacking Poland. So they, they get him on details where he says, where 
however many hundred people were killed, they say, oh, no, the number's not right. It's a different number. But the, it, it seems inconvertible that, it, that the Poles did it, not the Nazis. And that book is available if you want to look around for it. And this is a, a uh, monument there in, in Yedvadne that you see what it says here, Yedv set in Yedvadne in, in 2001. Uh, and it's a, a memory to the Jews of the uh, Yedvabna and the area, and the area who were murdered, burned to death in 1941. Uh, and you have, you know, other memorials for murdered Jews. We have Hannah Arendt wrote a, a, a book in the 1960s, very controversial, essentially where she's the controversial part is he says that the Jewish leaders participated in organizing the Jewish community, and without them, the Holocaust would not have been possible. Uh, pretty much discredited. Then in history writing, who owns the Holocaust? Some of you may know Michael Steinlauf, uh, and he, uh, he lives in Nanari. Poland and the memory of the Holocaust, bondage to the bed, dead. Poland and the memory of the Holocaust, and there is this notion that Poles think that they were the victims of the Holocaust. And Michael does a pretty good job at pointing out these, this controversy. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who admit it. I took this picture in 2012 in the town of Kielce, uh, commemorating a terrible pogrom that took there in 1946, right after the war. And here is a plaque by the Home Army, which is generally often attacked as being anti-Semitic. And here they put it up and say, look, we helped the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. Some of you may be familiar with this or coming to the end here of this theme song, the Jewish Partisans. You probably have heard, or many of you have heard this song that is sung even now at funerals of uh, Workman Circle. Zognit kein maas de geist am letzten Weg, wenn Himmel und Breien ihr verstellen bleue Tag. Kommen wird noch unser Reis gebänkte Schoss, wird der Peuktor unser Trottner sein in Dorn. And there's singable English. Never say that there is only death for you, though leaden skies may be concealing days of blue. The hour that we've hungered for is near. Beneath our tread, the earth shall tremble. We are here. Jewish survivors, there were few in Poland, few in Ukraine, numerous in the Soviet Union because they were able to get out to the east. Uh, and I, if you were interested, I would suggest you look on YouTube for this movie. Uh, it's a, a movie about a, a, a short story by Chaim Grada, who's considered one of the great Jewish writers of the 20th century, called The Quarrel. And two former yeshiva students meet in Canada in 1948, and they argue about what happened and what could have been done. Uh, you know, I, I leave it for you if you want to look at it. You can easily find it on YouTube. I'm trying to get... There were no... Now, just a review of the purges of the 1930s. You know, we've heard about the purges. Were they anti-Semitic? Or were they something else? Uh, I should point out in the 1930s, many Jews were killed, but other nationalities too. It wasn't particularly anti-Semitic, but by the time the Second World War comes, it be we really get a, a stronger Russian anti-Semitic nationalism. There's this Jewish anti-fascist committee and Solomon Michoels, an actor. Here he is, he came to the United States with Itzik Pfeffer, meaning Albert Einstein. Itzik Pfeffer was another writer, also turned out that he was a KGB, and in, in, uh, wasn't called KGB, but a secret police informant. And then, uh, but you get these things. They had the Jewish reporters, and they said, well, too many Jewish reporters. We've got to get rid of them. They say they go to the Tashkent Front, which means the Jews are accused of going over to Tashkent 
away from the war. They're cowards. You know, it's a smear. The Black Book, The Holocaust in Russia by Ilya Ehrenberg and Vasily Grossman, they, uh, they wrote this book, were not able to get it published in Russia until the 1980s. Came out in English in the 1940s. But it's a story of what happened to Jews in the areas of Russia that the Nazis were taking over. Uh, there it is, the complete black book of Russian Jewry. And then Grossman wrote another novel called Life and Fate, which is considered one of the great novels of, of Russia in the second half of the 20th century. What's called the Zhdanovshina. Andrei Zhdanov was the head of the secret police. You have this arrest and trial of Jewish writers and activists and this infamous execution of August 12, 1952, of uh, 15 Jewish activists, uh, not only writers, but others. And there was thought that this was going to lead to major pogroms. Uh, I think the Jews were saved by Stalin's death there. There was a fall in the mid 50s in Russia, but then things go back. And in 1968 in Poland, there's an anti Jewish campaign. They talk, the Zhila Komuna, the Kami Jews. Uh, here's a, uh, a picture of a May Day demonstration. Stay with the party, clean the party of this, from the Zionists. Uh, it was pretty ugly. In 1968, how many Jews are left? But it did promote the immigration of a number of the ones who had survived. In the 1970s, the Refusenik movement in Russia, there's this uh, Jackson Vanek amendment that uh, was intended to affect U.S. trade relations. And the Russians were very anxious to get rid of that. You begin to get, there's this book, Let My People Go. I'm, I'm throwing these things out in case you are interested in following up on it. And on the left is an example of an identity document of someone who left Russia. Uh, you see here, a lot of you see it. In Lenin, from Leningrad Airport, she's entitled to go to Israel although large numbers of those people uh, changed their mind once they got out, although there is a sizable Jew Russian Jewish population in Israel. After 1991, there's even more massive emigration. Here's the pot calling the kettle black. In 2004, Putin says the Ukrainian nationalists are anti-Semites. So Vladimir Putin is the great defender of the Jews, right? Currently, in Poland, the right wing is triumphant. Uh, liberties are being restricted. There's a move to change the judicial system. Uh, there, you know, this is about abortion. There's a minor Jewish revival in Poland and in some other areas of Eastern Europe, but there is persistent anti-Semitism. It's part of the culture. Uh, I'm not one... I don't agree with people who say, oh, he's a Pole, he's an anti-Semite. That is uh, absurd. Uh, but there is clearly uh, that tradition, as well as uh, people who are interested in finding their, the Jewish part in Polish past. So both things are going on. Uh, here's a right-wing demonstration. You know, this is Poland, not Pauline, which is the... Hebrew for Poland. But, you know, put an emphasis on something negative here, but there are a lot of positive things for Jews in Poland today, especially among the intelligentsia. It's the rural Catholic, uh, old style Catholic, uh, small town communities which support this anti Semitic notion. Well, now you have all these millions of Ukrainians in Poland and Poles in Western Europe, 
And after COVID-19, you know, when people, one person talks about a brain gain, if you will, all those uh, highly educated people fleeing from that area. Uh, in Ukraine today, there's a strong national feeling in Western Ukraine. The Eastern areas are the ones that are pro-Russian, but you have anti-Polish and anti-Semitic traditions along with a Jewish president. We, you know, we see Zelensky on, in the news every day. <clears throat> it's all of a sudden a Jewish hero for Ukraine. I mean, it's come, <coughs> come a long way since Khmelnytsky in 1648. But in 2011, there were over 900,000 Russian speakers in the U.S., most of them Jewish, or claim to be, not all of them. And a million went to the old Soviet Union, to Israel. My impression is that the, they are heavily uh, Netanyahu voters. This is a, a right-wing support in Israel. Uh, you know, I've gone on quite a long time. I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Larry.